Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you happy to be here today? Yes. Baruch Hashem and uh, Boker Tov to all of you this morning. And we're going to get right into the Word of God today. And uh, it's a week before the MJAA Southwest Regional Conference. So I will not be here next week, but you're going to hear a great word from Rabbi Eric. And uh, I know he's excited about the sanctuary of the heart that we'll be talking about. So we are going to be looking at a message today called Possessing All the Promises of God. And this is coming from Parshat Mishpatim. How many read there Six Days of Manna this week? Yes. Either on Facebook you got it, or if you emailed me, hopefully I got it to you, and uh, um, we're able to study together as a congregation. So we want to say a hearty uh, welcome to our first-time guests that are here. And, uh, Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, and Rosalind's happy. <laughs> and then, can you reconnect? Oh, it could be a dead battery. Well, there you go. All right, can you say a hearty bruhim ha'im to all of our first-time guests today and say welcome? <laughs> or if you're a returning family member today, we've got quite a few kids today. It's so great to have children in the house of the Lord like a Joshua generation. Shabbat shalom to everyone. And we're looking at this portion of Mishpatim, which comes from Shemot, or Exodus 21.1 through 24.18. We heard Yer Yermiyahu, or the book of Jeremiah, 34, 8 through 22, and also as a consolation, chapter 33, 25 through 26. Uh, the book of Matityahu for the Brit Harashah, the New Covenant, Matthew 5, 31 through 42, we read today. So we're going to get into our 10 minutes of Torah. Are you excited today? Yes. Uh, you don't sound too excited. Are you excited today? Yes. All right. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're looking at Exodus 21.1, and it says in the TLV, or Tree of Life version, which, by the way, is now on Bible Gateway, as it's always been on the New Version app, and uh, so you can also uh, uh, check out the Bible Gateway and, and see the Tree of Life is on there. That's a huge accomplishment. That means it's free of charge. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else excited out there? Yeah. Some, some of you have made the purchase of getting the Bible, and now it's available online, free for people all over the world to be able to read this new Messianic version. So we're grateful for that. Um, Bereshit, or, oh, it should be actually Shemot. I apologize for that. That's a typo there. Um, Shemot, or Exodus 21.1, says, Now these are the ordinances which you have said before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve for six years, and on the seventh he is to go free without payment. If he comes in by himself, he should go out by himself. If he, has, if he was married, then his wife will go out with him. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm sorry for this typo of the fair sheet. It should be Shemot. Exodus 21.4 says, If his master gave him a wife, she bears him sons and daughters, and the wife and her children will be her masters, and he will go free by himself. But if the servant plainly states, I love my master and my wife and my children, and I will not go free, then his master is to bring him to God. Uh, then take him to a door or to a doorpost, the mezuzah. And then it says his master is to pierce his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. What an interesting ceremony that is to say he wanted to be connected to the house. So there was this piercing of the ear. Who knows? That could have been uh, one of the ancient cult, uh, customs of the of the day to pierce an ear, showing belonging to some tribe or group, or even sometimes the cultic practices. Uh, uh, piercing could be connected to because tattooing and piercing could have been connecting you to the deity that you worshipped. But uh, God would sometimes take things and redeem them, and so this piercing of the ear was not only for beautifying sometimes among women to have wear earrings, but in those days, even men sometimes had nose rings, earrings. You'd just be amazed. King David had uh, quite a bit, and it says that all the Israelites, you know, they had tons of these earrings and nose rings and things of that nature. So uh, let's not look down on someone if they have a nose ring or an earring when we think it's not appropriate, because in the biblical days, they did have those, and they were just forms of uh, adornment. Um, in this case, this was a ceremony to show that you were connected to the house. They connected. Connected. It's funny, the vav is a nail that connects two things in Hebrew, and it means to uh, connect to concepts like boys and girls, men and women, you use the vav to connect the two. In this case, the hook. How many know the hook or the nail of Messiah connects us to him? 
Amen. It not only nails our sins to his cross, but it also uh, connects us eternally to the Father through Messiah. So it's interesting when you talk about being pierced, Yeshua was pierced for us, wasn't he? Yes. So you can see a picture of that. What's interesting about that is not only is he the pierced one, but he's the door. Mm -hmm. He's the door of the sheepfold. So being connected to the house is, uh, is, is seen in this ceremony of the servant who should be released after six years, who wants to stay a member of the household. His whole family has been developed there. He wants to stay a part of the house, and he stays connected through this ceremony of being, having uh, his ear pierced but the ceremony is done to the door. Obviously, they then release him from the door. But uh, the key was that that was the way they pierced his ear. And it's interesting that, that the piercing was done on the door or the mezuzah, the door frame, because that's where the blood was applied that freed all of Israel. And it also was the place where the mezuzah, formerly known as we call it a mezuzah today, the mezuzah is the door frame, but it's also the name of the little case that we hold Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, the Shema in. And we put it, it says right on the doorpost of your house. Instead of literally writing on a doorpost, we write it on a scroll that gets put into the doorpost in a little container called the doorpost or the mezuzah. So there's a ceremony here that connects to the freeing of Israel from Egypt. And the blood, how interesting. You'd pierce the ear and who knows if there'd be a little bloodshed there. I just kind of think about that, you know, and I, I remember my daughter crying the first time she got her ears pierced. It was like, ah! After that, she was fine. It took a little while for that, ill to, that ear to be able to handle an, uh, earrings without some kind of infection or anything like that. We had to put stuff on it, and I remember all the process. I can imagine that this was any, a way for the servant to always remember, you chose to be pierced to the door of the house. Yeah. You chose to follow your master. You chose. And that's like you and I. We choose to do that. Amen? Yeah. We choose to follow him. We choose to have this ceremony of saying, I want my ear to the door. Mm -hmm. The rabbis say it, it's interesting that Shema means to hear with the ear, but also to hear and obey. So the servant is saying, even though I'm free, I'm going to hear and obey by piercing my ear to the door. How many of us have our ear to Yeshua? Yes. And are hearing what he's telling us to, to, to hear. He said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what this spirit is saying. Now, let's go beyond this concept of servants being connected to the house. Um, and let's go into uh, a little deeper thought. Again, uh, it should be Shemot. Uh, Exodus 23, uh, 27 says, I will send my terror before you and throw all the people to whom you come in, to, uh, well, excuse me, all the people whom you will come into panic and many all your and make all your enemies turn their back to you. So it's interesting when you think of this concept of, of Israel going in to possess the land, God says, I'm going to send terror before you and throw all the people to whom you will come into panic. So when you come, the enemy is afraid. What are we afraid of then? We should be afraid. He should be afraid. Our adversary should be afraid when we show up. Because we're coming in the name of the Lord. And when we come in the name of the Lord, like David killing Goliath, our enemy is defeated. Amen. So we should never be afraid to come into a situation where the enemy is trying to threaten us and tell us, you better back off, you better go backwards, you better go back to Egypt where you belong. No, no, I belong in the promised land. I don't belong in the past. I belong in the future that God has for me. And that's what I'm pressing towards. So in verse 29, it says, I will drive them out, it says, before you in a single year. Otherwise the land would become desolate and the animals of the field will multiply against you. But, what, but little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you are fruitful. Then you will possess the land. How many realize that the, the Lord is driving the enemy out little by little out of your life? Amen. So line upon line, precept upon precept, faith to faith, strength to strength, glory to glory. He's trying to push the enemy back. He's trying to get you to take one step at a time, one line of scripture at a time, one precept at a time, and begin to build a walk of faith that knows that when you come into a situation, the enemy is actually more afraid of you than you should be of him. Amen. You're pushing the enemy back one day at a time, one uh, a moment at a time. Little by little, I will drive them out. Little by little. <laughs> Poco a poco, right? And so we say, little by little, I will drive them out be from before you until you are fruitful. Then you will what? 
You will what? I can't hear you. You will what? You will possess the land. What land does God want you to possess this year? Ultimately, God wants us in the promised land of Israel and Jerusalem. We'll all be there one day. Maybe it'll take the Jerusalem to become new again for us to be in the new Jerusalem. Until then, we can plan trips to travel there. But beyond the actual land that God was speaking concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's inheritance, I want you to think about what God wants you to possess this year. What promise has God given you that you're supposed to possess? But there is another problem in your way. There's a giant that's trying to scare you and push you back. And God's saying to you, you should know that he's more afraid of you than you are of him. He's more afraid of you. So whatever fear you have, forget about it because God is the bigger G out of the G's. You're not a little grasshopper and he's not a big giant. But your God is a big God. Amen. And to God, the giants are small. Right. Very small. Just like the problems are really small. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, you can say an amen on that one. That's a good stuff right there. Now, last up, a thought I have from the Torah portion, um, or from, our, from the Torah today, is from Vaikra, Leviticus 20, verse 24. It says, But I have said to you, you will inherit their land, and I will give it to you to what? Possess, Possess it. A land flowing with what? Milk. Milk and honey. I am Adonai your God who has set you apart from the peoples. So I set you apart and I'm giving you their land. What that means is they're unholy, you are holy. Therefore, it's my holy land and I can choose to give it to a holy people. So you're going to be my holy nation, my peculiar people. You're going to be a chosen generation. You are going to be kings and priests in that land. And you're going to do what they couldn't do. Yeah. They couldn't live holy. They couldn't represent me and be my king and my priest. They, couldn't, they wouldn't be chosen. All nations heard the, the Torah at Sinai, and they heard the ten words. Yeah. But only Israel said, Na mm. <clears throat> I will do, and I will continue to obey what I hear. Mm. This is what we need to do as a people. We need to be set apart by saying, Na We need to possess the land that God is putting ahead of us. Amen. I even believe we're some kind of Yeshua. There's some land that God wants to bless us with. Amen. I don't know. I pray for some of you to get like a million dollars. No, I'm not kidding. Because I'm thinking of that tithe you're going to give to buy our parcel of land. No, I'm, I'm not joking. This community has not seen a messianic congregation like they're going to see. That means we've got to get strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and believe that God wants to raise us up for such a time as this. And though we've been secluded in obscurity and in the darkness in the back in the booth in the corner of the dark, we've been like David in the field keeping sheep, you know, and nobody knows about us. And the prophet has to ask about us. Where's that other brother at? Where's that other son at? You know, of Jesse. But guess what? God's saying, I'm about to take you out of the field and I'm about to bring you into big places. Yeah. Now, it's not about buildings. It's not about money. It's not about wealth. It's about possessing what God said I want you to have. Yes. It's not about you lusting after it. It's about saying, it's your time. Now, I've always been the kind of person, I said, no, not me, Lord, not me. I was like Moses, no, not me. I remember my first time being asked to speak or preach in a church, uh, in a youth group. And I just, I, 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 I said I would, it was a five-minute sermonette on one of the uh, uh, parables of, 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 uh, of the Messiah. And I said, oh, okay, I'll do it. But then I, the whole time I was doubting myself whether I could do it. And my knees were, sh you know, knocking with the idea. And finally, me and my friend were supposed to tag team it. And, and he said he didn't want to do it. So I said, well, if he's not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> How funny, about a year later, I became the youth pastor of the whole youth group. Because even though I said no, God said yes. And you need to know that sometimes you're saying no to God when you, see, you say no to the giant. And saying yes to God, because God's bigger than the giant. And we need to say not say finish mine. Now let's take a look at the prophet, uh, uh, prophetic precepts of the Haftarah. And... Uh, I want to actually take you to Joshua because I think it relates to this idea of possessing the land because with Joshua, that's where they actually go ahead and possess the land of promise. So as we take a look at 10 minutes of the Haftarah, let's take a look at Joshua 5.1. Now it says, Now it came to pass, or excuse me, and it came about when all the Amorite kings beyond the Jordan westward and all the Canaanite kings by the sea, heard how Adonai had dried up the waters of the what? Jordan. Jordan. And how 
uh, or before B'nai Israel, which means the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, until they had crossed, their heart melted, nor was there any spirit in them anymore. Literally, they lost their breath, they lost their heart, they lost their drive, they lost all their fierceness. There was no spirit in them anymore. They were almost dead men. Because of B'nai Israel. Remember, he's, God said in the Torah, I'm going to put fear in them. He literally, in the verses that I didn't read, says, I'm going to send a hornet to drive them crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine if like, literally a bug you know, comes buzzing your way and that drives you out of battle? Yes. Why do you let things bug you so much? <laughs> the enemy's trying to send a bug, a pestilence, an irritant your way to drive you out of the battlefield. But if you'll stand your ground and be still and know that he is God, God will bug your enemy and bug him right out of battle. Yes. I'm praying that your problems become plagued by God's provision for you. Amen. That they're fearful of what they might think they could even do to you because they're touching God by touching you. Yeah. The apple of his eye. Amen. That's my prayer. Now, look what it says. I love this in uh, verse 2. At that time, Adonai said to Joshua, Make yourself flint knives and circumcise again, B'nai Israel, a second time. Wow. What's this all about? Verse, not, not too fun, right? <laughs> verse number 3. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised B'nai Israel. That's a lot of people. That's a long day of circumcision. That's more, you talk about hospitals being packed. This took, all, this took day and night, I'm sure. It says, circumcise all B'nai Israel at Gebiat Ha Arolot. Um, Arolot. And it says here, now this is the reason why Joshua was circumcised. All the people that came out of Egypt were who? Yeah. Males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt, except for who? Obviously Joshua, and who else? Caleb, Caleb. Now verse 5 says, though all the people that came out were circumcised, all of them. Remember, you couldn't even eat the lamb unless you were circumcised. A Gentile that was eating with you that night could eat the matzah. He could drink the wine. He could partake of the meal, except he couldn't have the meat. So I say you can't have the main course, so the main course is for Israel. Why? They cried for deliverance, and I gave them a lamb. Therefore, it's for them. If you want to be included in, you can, but you have to realize this is a covenant meal. The only way to be a part of this is to be a part of the covenant. So if they wanted to actually eat and partake of the lamb, not just be under the blood's protection, but partake of the lamb, they had to cut covenant. That means they had to be circumcised. That was not obligatory. It was voluntary. You could choose to do that. You could have just ate the matzah, been okay with that, and... You know, enjoy the appetizer. But the main dish was for Israel. So God said, the only way to know that these Egyptians are really with you, because they could turn against you, they could be there stealthily with you, working for Pharaoh. <clears throat> just imagine the mentality. And in fact, just so you know you can trust them, because before you could trust them. So just so you know you can trust the Egyptians that are with you on that Passover evening, if they get circumcised, they're proving that they really want this. Okay, so we see this circumcision is not for those who were circumcised, but those of the younger generation that had never been circumcised in the wilderness of wandering. So here we see it says, um, verse 5, Though all the people that came out were circumcised, none of the people that were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had been what? Circumcised. Had been circumcised. Look at verse 6. For B'nai Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation's men of the war of war who came out of Egypt died out because they had not listened to the voice of Adonai. To them, Adonai had sworn that he would never let them see the land which God or Adonai had sworn to their fathers that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. What did Leviticus 20, 24 say? It was a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Now, we understand that God promised here, as he did before, I will not let them enter the land. I swore, he says. God, in other words, God literally cut a covenant not only to get Israel out of Egypt, but then he cut a covenant to keep the doubters in the desert. God has cut a covenant to keep the doubters in the desert to never enter the promised land. And how many know if you doubt the promise, you can't receive the promise? Right. So you're choosing your own destiny by doubting. Yeah. Because you're detouring your destiny instead of entering the land of promise. You can't blame God. 
You blame yourself for doubting him. In fact, worse than doubt, you gossip about his leaders that they're they they trying to lead you, and you talk about the people that are trying to train you. So how can you learn anything if you're talking against your teacher? No. It's funny, I, I, I always question that when, whenever I teach Bible college, and I have students that will sit around and say, why do we have to memorize these verses, and why do we have to read all this material, and why do we have to do that? Why come against the very reason you paid money to show up for class and get an education, and you're going to question the process? There's a method to the madness of the teacher, right? And he's trying to get you out of Egypt, in, through the wilderness, into the promised land. But if you can't follow the process and the procedure, you'll never make it to the promise. I know that's a lot of peace to handle this early in the morning, but it's really true. There is a process to your purpose. And until you're willing to be processed, even cheese sometimes has to be processed. It's not as good as the real cheese, but I mean, you know. But there is a process. You know mozzarella? There's like a whole squeeze. You ever seen people make mozzarella cheese? It's like pulling and stretching and kneading and uh, all this stuff to get you in the store this nice mozzarella cheese. Sometimes they even grate it for you in advance so you can make your pizza. Right. In fact, if you're too lazy to do that, you can buy the pizza already made. <laughs> Ready to go in the oven. And if you're still too lazy, you can go to the place and let them cook it for you too. <laughs> but what if you can make it from scratch Amen. and know what's going in? Yeah. God says, I want you to do this from scratch. I don't want you to carry anything from Egypt over into your promised land. I want you to start over from scratch and leave the sins of the past behind and let me give you the ingredients of what it's going to take to make the bread that you're needing that will last because man does not live by bread alone but by every word, every instruction that comes from the mouth of God. And if you follow my instructions, I'll get you to the promised land. And when you get to the promised land, you won't need man anymore. You're going to eat the fat of the land. The land flowing already with milk and honey. Now, stop for a second. I pondered this this week. When they went into the promised land, the ten spies, what did they see? Big what? Giant. Right. Okay, you went there. Yeah, they saw big giants. I was actually thinking about the big fruits. Right. Do you know to your enemy, the fruits are not big, they're normal? Mm. Right. To giants, giant pomegranates are normal. Right. To us with small minds, small pomegranates are what we're used to. And in the wilderness, we have small thinking. That's why we complain about stuff that's too big for us. Because we can't see ourselves big enough to handle it because we see ourselves like grasshoppers when we see everybody else like giants. Have you ever think about people that are in the faith that are giants in the faith? Oh, I can never be like so-and-so. And You might name your favorite preacher, teacher, or evangelist, or pastor, or, or someone with the gift of God in their life. And you say, but they're a giant in the faith. And you tell yourself you can't be that. Why can't you? If you were to have heard their story, they would tell you they probably were illiterate before they read the Bible. I know someone who was a preacher that was illiterate before he opened up the Bible and God taught him how to read from reading the Bible. But prior to that, he didn't know how to read. So what you call a giant is someone who started off thinking like they were a grasshopper. What if you could imagine that the fruit's not so big because God, actually, the fruit's kind of small. <laughs> What it means is, what God has ahead of you, you're not familiar with. Right. It's like living on Taco Bell when God wants to invite you to Ruth Chris. Right. The mentality is, I don't belong there. Yeah. Can you imagine the Israelites said, I saw the land, it looks great, but I don't belong there. Yeah. You might tell yourself the house is too expensive, the car is mm -hmm. going to take too much gas, the job is going to require too much out of you, the marriage is going to mean you've got to stop living single and start thinking like a, 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 a one. But whatever it is you think is too big for you, God says, I'm taking you there anyway. So you might as well change the way you think about it and start embracing it, knowing it, and loving it. Because I want you to live and possess that land. And until you embrace the promise, you can't possess the possession of it. Because you have to dispossess your enemy before you can possess the land that belongs to you. Stop telling yourself that job is not for you. Stop telling yourself that marriage is not for you. Stop telling yourself that property is not for you. It is for you. If God promised it, what he spoke, he'll do it. What he's promised, he's going to bring it to pass. Amen. You've got to trust him. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, let's take a look at verse number 7. Um, it says, But he raised up their children in their place. Joshua circumcised them, for they were uncircumcised since they had not been circumcised along the way. Do you remember the nailing of the servant to the door? The purpose was to connect him to the house. In the way Eliezer was nailed to the door of his master, Abraham. Therefore, he could act like a son instead of a servant. And if 
Abraham wouldn't have had Isaac, then who would have received the inheritance? Yeah. Eliezer, the servant. When you're in the kingdom of God, servants are treated like sons. Because sons are expected to serve as servants, voluntarily. You've got to nail your ear to the door of the house. Not to the, the ear of gossip. Not to the ear of doubt or disbelief. Not to the, to the hearing of negative words. But you've got to nail your ear to the door of the house. If God has planted you in some kind of Yeshua, nail your ear to the door. In fact, let us do it. We'll do a good job. Yeah. We'll even put some earrings in afterwards. No, I'm just kidding. What I mean by that is be committed. Right. Make a commitment that what we saw today with all these children, let's have it every Shabbat. Amen. Let's imagine possessing a land of promise for our young people where young people are packing it out on a Friday night and they just are gleaning from the, from the youth leaders that are just pouring into them because they're hungry to possess the land that we've been talking about that God wants Amen. for us. Amen. See, if we talk about it, they'll want it. If we don't talk about it, they won't want it. And if we talk negatively of it, they'll think they can't have it. We have to tell this generation they can have the promises of God. Look at verse number 11. On the day after what day? Passover. Passover. On that very day they ate the produce of the what? Right. Land. Yeah. Uh, matzot, which is the matzah. And roasted grain. Then the manna ceased. On the day after they had eaten of the produce of the land, Bene Israel made manna no longer, but ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan that year. So in other words, you're not going to live on miracles anymore. You're going to live by principle. Because now you've got to sow seed in good ground and grow a harvest. Before you could just believe God for a miracle and God has to always fix our problems by a miracle. Oh, I don't have any water. Okay, water out of a rock. Oh, we have no bread. Okay, bread from heaven. Oh, we have no meat. Okay, quail from heaven. That is like El Pollo Loco gone crazy. <laughs> they had to say stop. It was a 30-day quail storm. Right. Think about that. Stop. <laughs> People bring you free chicken. You're going to say stop? No. I mean, but it's because they complained about it and they were complaining about stuff they really didn't want. Right. Well, why don't we have this and why don't we have that? And then when you get it, you don't appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a sermon by itself. Maybe that's next time. But let's keep going. Now, let's watch this. Now they're living by what they've sown in the land. Are you willing to sow into your promise? I'm not talking about money. I'm not about to take an offering. Are you willing to sow into your promise? That means whatever problem you have right now, go to the Word of God and find the promise in the word of God. What does God say about your sickness? What does God say about your lack of money? What does God say about your lack of faith? What does God say about your lack of rest? God wants you to have peace, not just on Shabbat, but every day. In fact, Shabbat is supposed to be an overflowing rejuvenation of rest that flows into the rest of your week so you're not tired all the time. Amen. How many have been tired lately? Yeah. Maybe we're not getting out of Shabbat where we're supposed to. We're supposed to get so filled up on Shabbat with the fellowship, with the worship, with the praise, with the corporate convocation that we're uh, having an assembly together and strengthening each other and iron sharpening iron and praying for one another. On Shabbat, we should be so communal. We should be so together. We should so, be so united that we just like, you know, this afternoon we're having Bar and Bat Mitzvah. I encourage you, even if you're not preparing for your Bar and Bat Mitzvah, come anyway and commune with us this afternoon between Amen. 2 and 3 so you can have time and fellowship. Couples fellowship, be there. Uh, you know, if it's women's fellowship, ladies, be there. And, hey, men, we're going to have to plan a trip up to the mountains or something and just commune together because we are meant to be stronger together than alone. Now, if we take a look at the book of Daniel, I love what it says here about the coming of the Messiah. This is the ultimate purpose why Messiah came. The reason that God raised up Moses and Joshua is the reason why he gave us Messiah. It says in Daniel 7, 13, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like a son of man. And it is actually Bar Enosh. The son of suffering. Enosh means middle, a, a, a mortal, feeble, sick man. He took our sicknesses. He bore, right, our diseases. It says, it's a descendant of Adam, but it's literally the one that realized they need to call upon the name of the Lord, Enosh. One like a son of man, coming with the clouds of what? Heaven. So someone who looks human. But he's glorious with the clouds of heaven. That's an oxymoron right there. Because how can someone that looks human be flying in the air? 
So you see the vision of the man, he's saying he's called the Son of Man. That's a messianic title, Son of Man. Dr. Luke teaches us about the Son of Man more than any other gospel. But the concept is, he looks divine from the heavens, but he's human. This is a picture the rabbis say of Messiah. According to Rashi, French Jewish commentator, who's most respected within Judaism, this is the Messiah in this verse. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeshua quotes this about himself in Matthew 24. It's mentioned by John in Revelation chapter 1. And it's quoted many times in Luke. And, and that God will send Messiah, the Son of Man, with clouds of heaven, which means with great authority and dominion. Let's keep reading. He says, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the, God the Father. And was brought into his presence. So here's the Messiah coming into his presence after some kind of battle. It says in verse uh, 14, the first part it says here, Dominion, glory, and sovereignty were given to him that all peoples, nations, and languages should what? Serve, Serve him. Now, let's take a look at the latter part of, of verse 14. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Now think about the previous kingdom of David and Solomon. In a sense, it passed away or was destroyed. Right? Yes. The northern yes. region of Israel was destroyed by the, Babylon, uh, by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And Babylon destroyed Judah in 586 B.C. So this prophecy make, makes no sense in Babylon that there's an everlasting kingdom, which we know the kingdom was destroyed by the Babylonians. But Daniel's being told in Babylon, don't worry, there's coming an everlasting kingdom that will never be destroyed. And we already said that Jewish commentators say this is the Messiah yet to come. And actually this ministry of the Messiah has, is yet to come. Because when Yeshua came the first time, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. So he set up a kingdom in the heart of men, not on earth. But when he comes again, he will come up to set up the physical, not the spiritual, the physical kingdom on earth. So it says, look at verse 18. But the Kedoshim, uh, it says the Kedoshim, or saints, which means the holy ones, of the Most High will receive the kingdom and what? Possess the kingdom forever. Yes, forever and ever. Not only does Messiah receive dominion, but he says you as his kingdom of priests, we will possess the kingdom forever. So as Joshua possessed the land of Israel, we will possess the new Jerusalem. We will possess the whole world because the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Messiah. Amen. His anointed one. That's Revelation uh, chapter 11. Now, let's get ready for some Breed Hadashah. You ready? Yes. Let's take a look at the Breed Hadashah because now we know we're supposed to possess the kingdom, possess those promises. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. I think this is perfectly lining up with the Joshua story and what God promised through Moses that they would enter to a land and possess it. It says, Therefore, just as the Ruach HaKodesh says, that's the Holy Spirit, today if you will hear my, uh, his voice, do not what? Harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In Hebrew, the Merivah, which means the quarreling, found in Exodus 17, 1 through 7. On the day of testing, or Masah, which is, Masah actually is, is the Hebrew found in Exodus 17, 7, which translates to uh, a test. They tested me. So he, they spiritually named the place Merivah, which means quarreling, and Masah, Masah which means testing. So it says this testing was in the wilderness. Verse 9, there your fathers put me to the what? Test. test. Though they saw my works or my miracles <coughs> for 40 years, therefore I was provoked by that generation. And I said, they always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my what? Ways. My ways. Moses asked to know God's ways. Solomon asked to know God's ways. It's important for us to ask to know God's ways. Through the Messiah, we know his way. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life back to the Amen. Father. So he meant to show us the way back to him in Teshuvah, in repentance. So look at verse 11. It says, As I swore in my wrath, here's a quote from the Torah and the prophets, they shall not enter my what? Rest. rest. Say that again, but really feel it. Say rest. 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 No, do it with a deep breath, like uh, with an exhale. Rest. rest. That's what God wants for us. Rest. He says in verse 12, Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you, as an, 
has an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another. These are messianic believers. These are no longer Israelites per se in Israel or in Canaan land. This is you and I today, both Jew and Gentile. He says, encourage one another, especially because the book is Hebrews. It's speaking to Hebrew speaking Jews who are being told by Pharisees that there's no way Yeshua could be your high priest. And apologetically, the writer of Hebrews is telling us he is our high priest, but he's, he's at, after a different order, the original one, by the guy who was first called a high priest, which is who? Melchizedek. And so when we understand that the people that he's talking to in this passage are 1,500 years since Moses. Notice that what applied to Moses still applies to that generation. And if you're reading it, that means it still applies to us today. You catching that? Yeah. Let's, let's read it together again. Uh, let's read it at 13. Let's read this verse together. But encourage one another. Let's say it again. But encourage one another. One more time. But encourage one another. Not discourage. Let's encourage one another. Why? It's or 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 when. Another day by day. Encourage one another day by day. As long as it is called Hayom, or today. That's how you say it in Hebrew, which means the day. So that none of you may be hardened by deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Messiah. If we, have, if we hold our original conviction firm until the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not hearken your heart, uh, uh, um, harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So what does he mean by this, if you hear his voice? What did Israel hear at Sinai? They heard his voice. So he's playing off of the Sinai experience. and saying, well, if you hear his voice, just like they heard his voice, don't harden your heart and build a golden calf as they did. Don't test the Lord as they did. Don't worship a rod lifted up. Look at it, but that bronze serpent lifted up, don't worship it. Worship the one who commanded the, the instruction for it for your healing. Don't worship the, the process. You know, many times in denominations, we've worshipped our golden calves. We've worshipped our bronze serpents. We'll even stick to, all, you know, being called holy rollers in some churches. Yeah. Because at one time, someone in some Pentecostal charismatic meeting rolled on the floor, so we all thought we were supposed to all roll on the floor. And so people started mimicking that. And actually, Satan worshipers and mediums and sorcerers would come to almost mimic the gifts of the spirit that were operating just like pharaoh's magicians would mimic the miracles of Moses. there are movements right now i'm not going to name any because you'd probably get offended there are movements right now where people are barking and laughing and punching people in the stomach and shaking people to the ground until they fall on the ground saying that they're slain in the spirit guess what if the power of god touches you so be it but no one should push you down on the ground and call it the Holy Spirit. Amen. No one. I don't care how anointed they are. Their hand is not that anointed that they have to do this to me. Yes. <laughs> you know, or the, you know, like get the death grip there. You're like, <laughs> push it into your forehead. You know, they used to say Catherine Kuhlman would barely, with her little, tiny little tender finger, just barely touch someone and they'd feel the presence of God and all. And, and I'm not here to validate, you know, Catherine Kuhlman or any uh, other uh, wolf man or woman of God, but... I'm just saying, if it really is the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit be the gentleman that he is. Let him be the comforter he is. Don't let him push people or force people. In fact, as preachers, we shouldn't push people. As rabbis and teachers, we shouldn't push people. We should encourage one another. Amen. You as, as ministry leaders and, and, and uh, lay members within the congregation, do your ministry not with a push, but with the presence, Amen. with an influence that lets people know you love them. You're not pushing them. Yes. Barbara, you can't push people to dance. They gotta wanna dance. I can't push people to worship. They gotta wanna worship. Even when I'm singing, I can't go, come on, sing! <laughs> Sounds like a choir director, right? Come on, sing! I used to be in a choir, mass choir where they actually did that to me one time. The guy was like screaming his lungs at me and he wanted me to sing with a smile. I'm like, really? <laughs> but you can't push people. You can't even push them into the promises of God. Amen. You gotta want it. You gotta claim the promise that you feel in your heart is a yes and amen that belongs to me. You're hearing something today, you say, that's for me, Rabbi. You're speaking right down my alley. You're telling me what I've been praying about and speaking about. Hey, I'm not telling you, he's telling you. I'm lips of clay. His words are eternal, not mine. All I can do is tell you what this 
this wonderful word of God says, you have to claim the promise for yourself. Now, I'm going to show you in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, how we claim the promise for ourselves. It says, Let's, let us fear then, though a promise of entering his rest is left open. You know when you leave options open too long, sometimes those doors close. You've got to jump on the promise quickly. When God opens up a promise, you've got to claim the promise. You can't sit around two years, three years later and say, well, one day that promise will come to pass. pass. No, apply the promise to the problem now. Because even if you're, you're not going to get that promise fulfilled a year from now, start practicing the presence and the promise and purpose of God now so that one day you'll be ready to possess it. In other words, Israel, while you're in the wilderness, start applying the principles of the Torah now. So that when you go in, you'll be able to know. When, yeah, God told us year after year, we rehearsed the fact. He says, when we get to that land, we're going to sow seed in that land. And we're going to give God on the day of first fruits, the first fruits of our barley. Then we're going to give him the first fruits of our wheat. And then we're going to give him the final fruits of our harvest, the pomegranate, the grapes. We're going to remember that God told us this way back 40 years ago. And now we finally get to do it. So now that it's ingrained in your memory banks, and it's in your heart and your mind inscribed by the Holy Spirit, when it's time to really do it, it'll be easy. Amen. Isn't that what we do with our children? Yes. We impress the Shema. We impress it on their hearts. We literally grind it into their hearts like a scribe does on stone. Inscribe it into them so that when they grow up, they won't depart from what they've learned from us. To train up a child in the way they should go. In the way, the way, the way, the truth, the life. We're supposed to teach them that now before they ever possess it. Now, this is what it says in verse 2. Or actually, let me finish verse 1. Some of you would seem to have fallen short. We all fall short of his glory, but we should not fall short of his promises. There's a promise that God is waiting for you to enter through. The door's open. If you wait too long, it's going to close. God opens doors that no man can shut. He shuts doors that no man can open. If God's put in your heart to serve in a certain area of ministry, let us know now. Don't say, well, I was going to tell you three years ago that I really wanted to make challah bread. For... It will save us a couple bucks at Panera. That's great. But if not, we'll keep going to Panera because guess what? We're going to do what God has resourced us to be able to do. But if God's got a gift in you and you sit on it, guess what? You're robbing yourself and everybody else from the promise that God has for this congregation. How will we ever take that land that God has for us if we don't start applying the principles now? Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, look at verse 2. For we also have heard... Ha, uh, uh, excuse me. We also have had good news proclaimed to us, meaning the gospel, just as they did. But the word they heard did not help them because they were not unified with those who listened in faith. But they were unified. Uh, but they were not unified with those who listened in faith. It says, "For we who have trusted are entering into that what rest." rest. It is just as God has said. So in my wrath, I swore. Here's the quote. They shall never what? Enter my rest. Even though his works were finished since the foundation of the world. In other words, God created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh. Well, where'd you get that, Rabbi? I read the next verse. <laughs> Look at verse four. It says, for somewhere he has spoken. How funny the writer says, and well, somewhere it said, it's called Genesis. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So then it remains for some to enter into it. Yet those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of disobedience. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, oh, now we know it's absolutely connected to Israel because it mentions Joshua's name. How funny. Do you know the King James Bible? I think, I think it's, a, it's this passage that they, they put Jesus. You know why? Because they're the same name in Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> Yehoshua in Hebrew, Aramaic, Yeshua, and in Greek, Yesu. Now, when you think about this, yeah, it sounds like Jesus, right? When you think about this, how easy they were to mix things up. But obviously, the text is not talking about Jesus, or as we know him in Hebrew, Yeshua. He's actually talking about Joshua, because it's the same name, but the type of shadow is there. So as Joshua brought us into the land of promise, so Yeshua brings us into all the promises of God. 
Because he comes after Moses. Just like Yeshua came as a prophet after Moses. <laughs> Did you catch that one? That was a 747 right there. That was a good one. You should have jumped on that plane quick when you had a chance. Some good stuff. Now watch. Let me show you a, a, a revelation that you might not catch in your version. And this version, TLV, does clarify it. So there remains a what? Shabbat rest for the people of God. Now, let me tell you what King James says. Good old King James. It's good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for us. I used to hear that as a kid. If King James is good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Well, Jesus didn't read King James. Because King James wasn't before Jesus or during his time. Yeshua never had a New Testament even. He only had the Hebrew Scriptures. So this is what's amazing. It says, so there remains in Greek a sabbaton. The Greek word sabbaton is quoted in the Gospels every time it's Sabbath. So Yeshua went to the synagogue on sabbaton as usual. Uh, in Acts, Paul goes to the synagogue on sabbaton as usual. It's the word Sabbath. It could be translated Sabbath keeping or the keeping of the Sabbath. But nonetheless, it's translated everywhere else Sabbath. How deceptive. How lined up with replacement theology it is and how appeasing it is to just call it rest. Because everywhere else where the word rest is, it's a different word for rest. This is not rest like in the other portion of other verses. This is Sabbath. So it doesn't say there's a rest for the people of God, so you could just make any day your day of rest. It says there's still a Sabbath for the people of God. So this text says there's still a Sabbath rest. Complete Jewish Bible says there's still a Sabbath keeping for the people of God, I believe. Now, this is where it comes from. It's a direct quote from the Hebrew that talks about a Sabbath of complete rest, or in Hebrew, a Shabbat of Shabbats. It's called Shabbat. Shabbaton. Say Shabbaton. 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 It means a Shabbat of Shabbat. A Shabbat rest of Shabbat rest. Or it's like saying King of Kings. Lord of Lords. It's a Hebraic way to say a rest of rest. A Sabbath of Sabbaths. So if anything, get all out of the Sabbath you're meant to, to get out of it. Because when you talk about your king, he's King of Kings, he's better than any king that came before him. He's Lord of Lords. All the Lords before, they don't compare to the Lord of Lords. He has dominion over all of them. A Sabbath of Sabbaths. So it's translated Sabbaton because in Greek they don't have the sh sound in Greek. So they're left with an S. And Shabbaton is a direct transplant from Hebrew into the Greek and neutering it with the letter sheen becoming the S sound. And Sabbaton gets translated rest and it should be Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Write that in your Bible if it's not there. It should be a Sabbath rest. Now, what are we really saying? Are we saying that we should get legalistic and tell every Christian that they're wrong for worshiping on Sunday? No, because it's not wrong to worship on Sunday. Because every day is a day of worship. Amen. But there's only one day of rest. Because right. God commanded us, work six days, rest the seventh. Yeah. He didn't say, work six days and find some day to rest on. He says, the day of the Sabbath. It's set. And the Lord is the Lord of the Sabbath. That means after all your week, You've worked for your employer, now give me a whole day at the end of it to praise me for what I helped you accomplish all week long. Amen. And you're tired from the work you've done, so let me refresh you with my rest because I did the same. I modeled what you should, what you should represent. And you should work six days and rest on the seventh. Try to do this. Not only with your manna six days a week, try to see if you can get your, week, your week's Goals accomplished in the six days. Yep. Instead of going, well, if I don't get it done, I can just do it Saturday. Hmm. No, because then you make an excuse why not to come to some crazy show. Right. And then you don't get to see your brothers and sisters and worship together. Right. Because you're so tired, they're like, oh, I'm too tired to go today. And sometimes we say we're sick when we're really just tired. Yeah. Sick and tired. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired on the Sabbath. Yeah. I want to be rejuvenated today. I feel strong as an ox. No, like this. Strong like bull. Yeah. <laughs> because I've been allowing my week to be filled with a lot of work so that I'm so tired I go to bed Friday night after, you know, by sundown I'm just ready to go. <sighs> it was so nice to come home and just be like done, 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 done. Even my message, everything. Just, just <sighs> I was done with printing. I was done with everything. Yeah. And it felt so good just enter into a perfect rest. And my wife was like, it looks so good to see you rested. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel rested. And just we just sat around and just enjoyed 
presence of God. And I, I will have to admit, there are times where I'm still trying to get my thoughts together. It's yeah. Friday night. Yeah. And I have decided I am no longer doing that. Amen. I'm going to rest with you. I'm going to enjoy my Shabbat with you. Amen. And I want you to enjoy it with me. Amen? Amen. How are we going to do that? Let's finish this passage and then we're done today. In verse 11 it says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that what? Rest. That rest. So the Sabbath is a model of that rest, but it's not the rest. <coughs> so just because you come here on Shabbat doesn't mean you're resting. Right. You can come here very anxious and not be resting. So, the, so what the Sabbath is is an eternal picture of the rest which is spiritual, that God wants you to embrace and to receive in your spirit, man. You can physically come here on Shabbat and say, I kept the Sabbath. But it doesn't mean you're spiritually rested. That's right. Think about how many times you left here frustrated. Oh, man. Think of times where you actually just grumbled and complained while you're here. Oh, why are they doing that? Why is it that? I don't like this. Stuff. Aren't we just a bunch of Israelites in the wilderness still? Yes. <laughs> oh, this is the promised land. No, it's not. Not when we're grumbling and complaining. Right. We walk away more bad than when we came. Yes. Why come and be frustrated? Why not enjoy this? This is such a blessing to be here. I thank God every time I get to drive an hour to get here. Yes. It's joyful yes. to walk through that drive through that wilderness. Yes. From Indio to, to San Jacinto. Come on. Like, I love this. It says, so that no one may fall through the same fall through the same pattern of disobedience. Wow. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-inches sword. It pierces right through the separation of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our hearts that no creature is hidden from him, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Wow. And I close with this passage, 2 Corinthians 1.20. For in him all the promises of God are what? Yes. yes. And therefore also through him is the amen by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who establishes us with you in Messiah. We're partakers of Messiah. He, had, he anointed us, set his seal on us, gave us the Ruach, the Spirit, and our hearts as a pledge, as an earnest of the guarantee. Wait a minute, isn't he modeling the Israelites? That yeah. God gave us Moses as our leader, just like he gave us Messiah today. That he gave us uh, an anointing over our life. Didn't he allow the same spirit that came upon Moses to come upon the elders of Israel and they began to prophesy? Didn't he tell the whole nation, I want you to just be kings and priests unto me, not just the Levites? Didn't he really want them to all be ministers of reconciliation? Didn't he want all of them to receive that? Well, how about this one? He set a seal on us. Didn't he call all of us as, uh, Israelites as chosen? He put a seal upon them as chosen people. Am Wait a minute. He gave them the Ruach. Didn't the Spirit of God show up to give them the Torah in their hearts as well as the Torah on stone? Mm -hmm. Didn't he give them the Torah the, the way he gave it to us in our hearts? Yeah. Isn't it the same picture? It is. Dianu, if he would have just brought us out of Egypt. Dianu, if he would have, come on, brought us to the Red Sea. Dianu, if he would have brought us to Mount Sinai. Dianu, if he would have just brought us to hear the Torah. Dianu, if he would have just, you know, get us through the wilderness to the promised land. Dianu. But guess what? If he would have just given us Shabbat. Dianu. But bless the Lord, he gave us all these things. And Dianu, he gave us Messiah too. Amen. It would have been enough, the Hebrew term means. Dianu. Sufficient that he's in our hearts. Praise the Lord. Amen. Today I want you to write down these four things that I want you to walk away with about the promises of God and possessing them. Number one, Hashem's servants must have their ears nailed to the door. Yeah. You're going to serve here at some Yeshua? Nail your ear to the door. Hmm. Open your ear up and hear where you can serve and be a be obedient to God's covenant, where you can find a niche, a spot, where you can do something that makes you feel fulfilled when you come. Have your ear nailed to the door. Be hearing what God wants you to do in his house to be a servant of God. Second, Hashem circumcises his servants to become sons. See, when they were in the, Egypt, they were slaves. When they left Egypt, they became his servants. Right. But when they entered the promised land, they were circumcised as sons. Yeah. Slaves to servants to sons. Hashem drives out the enemies that try to block our promise. So once you've been circumcised in your heart, you become a son of the house, God says, I will drive out the enemy that tries to block your promise. And lastly, Hashem allows his chosen to enter the rest of Messiah and claim all his promises. That in him, all the promises of God are yesterday. Amen. Amen. You receive that today? Yes.
How many are ready to receive that promise? Amen. Next, uh, uh, this week, uh, starting with tomorrow, we're going to be looking at offerings, the uh, uh, atonement cover of the mercy seat, the menorah with its seven lambs, the pattern, holy of holies, or the holiest of all, the altar, and then Rabbi Eric's going to preach a message called Sanctuary of the Heart. I cover your prayers because next week while I'm gone, I'll be at the MJA conference and be a part of the tour service there, and that's an honor to do that. And then right after lunch that day, when we all fellowship for lunch, those that are coming, um, we'll have a 2 o'clock class, and I'm going to be teaching on the double portion of Elisha that he received from Elijah. Would you stand today? If you receive this message, would you just bless the Lord? Amen. I said, if you receive this message, would you just bless the Lord? Amen. Amen. Stretch your hands for the blessing. As you bless him, he also continues to bless you. Amen. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May he shine his face upon you, be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace. And Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Establish peace for you, your children, and your children's children. For his namesake and love, we pray all these blessings in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua, Yeshua. Amen. 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 God bless you today. Amen. Shit, they know.